Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of Psalms. It's a song, a Hebrew song in the 106th Psalm. We continue from verse 16. It reads here, when, and the word when is and then. And so there are a couple of things that um, in Hebrew Psalms you, you find uh, quite interesting. The Hebrew Psalms have what we call sequential narratives. Like this, and then. Meaning after talking about verse 15, uh, you, we start a new uh, picture, a new imagery. So it's sequential. It's always in an imagery. And that is why uh, I've often expressed the, the fact that uh, the Hebrew language talks about things very similar to the Chinese language, which is also pictorial and in an imagery concept. Now, the other thing that I have also often said in um, in poetry, uh, which is like Hebrew Psalms, uh, they will be synonyms. Synonyms where you've got one or two or more statements and they all mean the same thing. And then, of course, you have the antonyms where you have one or more statements in a contrast, meaning the opposite of each other. Now that's how Hebrew Psalms work. And so we just can't just read it in English. You need to capture the sequential aspect, whether it is starting a new image uh, in the mind. And obviously, image is important that we follow the picture that is trying to describe. Uh, the synonyms, which are saying the same thing twice or more. The antonyms, uh, which is trying to contrast two statements. And oftentimes you find that the, the text of the Psalms, they are quite literal. But the literalness is always there to conjure the imagery. It's it's quite unlike the modern day songs, right? They 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 think they have artistic license to say things and depict things, and so they the modern songs depict imagery which many of us may not understand. But in a specific culture like the Hebrew people or like the Chinese culture, the culture itself defines. The imagery, because that's what they see. When we come to verse 16, we are now told they, they would be the Israelites, became envious of Moses in the camp and of Aaron, the Holy One of God. Now, this particular picture or, or the narrative that we're talking about here is in Numbers 16. And in Numbers 16, uh, we read about the episode where the, the people, the Korak and company, came to engage with Moses and Aaron. This is why, why are you the leader, right? Why are you the priest? We also want to be priests. And so this idea of envious literally means to make angry of Moses in the camp, in the camp where they are already camped together. And so Korach and 
the company. Company means the friends where they felt that why who made Moses the leader? Uh, we would like to have a more democratic way of doing things. And so number 16 is a very interesting passage where trouble brewed and people thought that you could actually uh, elect yourselves to be leaders and priests of God's nation. And that in itself is, is problematic. And so at the time of the book of Numbers, while they are in the wilderness, they thought they could do that. And uh, number 16 is already at the time where God said, uh, you're all not going to survive this. The first generation will die in the wilderness and the next generations will enter into the promised land. Now, obviously, when you read a psalm like this in verse 16, you need to be able to understand what actually happened in the book of Numbers, which contains the historical narrative of the events one year after the Exodus. After the, they prepared the tabernacle, uh, they were getting things ready to be inaugurated. So all of these things would be the background of the knowledge of the Israelites. And so when David says, tell about what God has done, understand, as we continued from Psalm 105 in verse 1, is to tell all the nations the two things that catches our minds when we read Psalm 105 and now 106 are the things that God had done in a positive way of demonstrating the power of God, that he has the power of doing spectacular things, awesome things, miracles, signs, wonders, which we cannot quite explain because God uses nature, but in such a way where it's unexplainable, it's indescribable. And hence, it is about public display of the powers of God, like the ten plagues in Egypt, uh, with the destruction of, and the silencing of the Elohim of Egypt, uh, with the crossing of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reed, where it's called Yam Suf. And what happened in the wilderness thereafter? So these are events that the Israelites continue to talk again and again and again. And if they had a chance to talk to the other nations, they want the other nations to know what God has done. Now in verse 16 onwards, we are going to read the negative side of God's display of power. And you find that this has to do with God showing his power to teach the Israelites a lesson. Now, I need to be very careful here because these are the moments where God immediately judged and destroyed what we would call enemies of Moses and Aaron. And they are considered enemies of God. They're all Israelites. But these Israelites are not particularly aware of this axiom. God's house. God's rules. What does that mean? We were talking about the tabernacle. Who should work in the tabernacle? Which individual should do that? And so on and so forth. And by saying God's house, God's rules, it is to respect the fact that the tabernacle is God's house. Whatever happens in God's house, it should be decided by God. Who gets to go into God's house and to do what also should be decided by God. 
Now, in verse 16, it begins a narrative of some very sad events, but it demonstrates the power of God. God, and they, they came and got Moses angry, and they were against Aaron, Aharon, and it's called the Holy One of God. Note, the Holy One of God is a special title. He is the special one. He is a high priest. Now, this is important. Why? Because there is only one high priest. And the high priest has descendants, and the descendants are all priests. And so God decided, not Aaron, that's what they forgot. They thought that Aaron elected himself to be the priest. And so they came with, uh, with Datan and Aviram. Uh, they, they thought they could do the same. But they didn't realize God's house God's rules. It was God who chose Moses. It was God who chose Aaron. It wasn't that they came in to volunteer themselves for the job because they realized it's God's house. It's God's rules. In that narrative in Numbers 16, verse 17 occurs as a song to remind those the earth opened and swallowed up Datan engulfed the company of Aviram. And so we find uh, that you have the swallowing of Datan and Aviram and the sons and daughters and other family members. You will have the event of the opening up of the ground and then a fire blazed in their company and the fire consumed the wicked. These two are together. And it avoided to talk about the plague. And the plague had many more people dying. God's house, God's rules, and God showed his power to judge all those who came against Moses and Aaron. Why? Because when they came against Moses and Aaron, it is as if they came against God himself. Because God placed Moses and Aaron in their positions, in their roles, in the house of God. When Datan, Aviram, uh, and the company of Korach, decided to challenge Moses and Aharon, God enlisted the authority that was him. If you come against God and you disrespect God by disrespecting God's appointed ones, then God came to show his power. The earth opened up really spoke about uh, the land that they where they stood and it opened up like a mouth. This, this word here, open, is a open as an open mouth. And then the other word here is to, to swallow, to engulf and to eat up. And this word swallow is actually uh, the, 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 the idea, uh, I guess you can say the same idea of uh, scorching and, and swallowing uh, in this area, the idea of consume. So think of it this way. These words are used to talk about engulfing, swallowing, swallowing gives you the, the, the picture of engulfing in the mouth. And so the earth opened its mouth and engulfed up everyone. And so this word uh, is engulfing. 
Unfortunately, the second word is not engulfing. This word is covering. Covering, concealing. But it has the same picture. The picture here is imagining the, the ground opening up like a mouth and Datan was sucked into the ground and then the company of Aviram also fell in. But the picture here is no longer about going in but about the earth closing up. But it's all part and parcel of that same event. And then in verse 18, there would be a fire. Now, two things here, the land and the fire. These two are elements which scares human beings the most. You cannot control earth activities or land activities you cannot control fire. And the fire blazed up in their company. They are, the fire was actually burning up. I think that would be a much uh, better word to use. Blazed up, burned up, and engulfed the wicked. And so the fire was all around. They are talking about the same thing, as you can see, an A and a B, an A and a B. So remember this synonym. You get two statements giving you the picture, which is about the same, about how the fire dealt with them, about how the land or the earth dealt with them. It's about swallowing, it's about closing up. It's about burning them and it's about enclosing them in the fire and they die. And so that would be uh, uh, a picture that you can see, right, in 17 and 18. So you see that these two are two very, uh, how should we say, a different event. So you have an and then and verse 17, uh, talks about what happened as a continuation, 16 and 17 as a continuation, and then 18 as a separate and then. And all these you don't read in the English because the Hebrew gives us the picture of how the imagery went. And so we do know that in number 16, this event came together when they challenged Moses. Then God sent fire after the fact. So these two events are just separate events. Now we come to verse 19. Verse 19. Now verse 19 uh, is very much an event in Exodus chapter 32. Uh, it is very important for us to realize that whenever we, we read this in the book of Psalms, we don't read the book of Psalms just by itself, but we should try to help relate it to what exactly happened at that time. This is Exodus chapter 32. 32. And so usually if you read the psalm, you should go back and understand the background. When Moses didn't come down, they thought that Moses was gone. And they decided to make a calf in Horeb and worship a cast metal image. So the idea of making directly violates Exodus 20 verse 4. You shall not make yourself any image of whatever God had made up in the skies, on the land, and in the water 
beneath, but they decided to make a calf. Now, the word calf here is a baby ox. And they did it at Horeb, which is at Sinai, because Moses didn't come down. They couldn't wait. They decided to use their jewelry when they came out of Egypt, and they melted it and asked Aaron to do it. And after they have made the molten cast, molten cast meaning you have made a, 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 a shell uh, and you melt the gold and then you pour the gold into a mold and then when the gold uh, sets and cools down, then you have a metallic image. We don't think that this golden calf is a big one, but it resembles their God. And in those days, please bear in mind, they're not making a, a, a one-ton gold. They are actually making a, a small image. Right, a small image, and in that small image, they then eventually decided that this would be their god. That was their biggest problem. They made this, and this what worshipped. Again, I want to point out does not exist. This word is to cause to bow down and in this case it is cause to bow down to the ground cause oneself to bow down to the ground now this would be very similar to the ancient days you know when the emperor comes by everybody would be face to the ground, and sometimes body to the ground, lying prostrated. This whole picture of lying down, bowing down, is to demonstrate that the person who's doing it has humbled himself. And the object of that homage would be someone with greater powers. One of the things that many people were asking, why uh, why an ox? Some had suggested that, well, it was because when they left Egypt, it was uh, in the sign of the Taurus, the bull, as the constellation. Now, I share a different opinion. The Hebrew people or the Semitic people has an ancient uh, pictogram. And the pictogram is of an ox head. And this represents might and power. And hence, uh, the ox head with the staff would give us the word L. And I would think that in their minds, they are looking for a replacement of God, L. And this is the Mighty One. And it's generally translated as God. Here, they make this image and then in verse 20, they exchange their glory for the image of an ox that eats grass. Now, the idea of exchange means to, to cause to, well, I guess you can say barter. So if they had importance, and by the way, importance is glory their weight. They took their importance and had 
exchanged it with that thing called the calf or the metal image, the image of an ox that eats grass. This is how God sees the event. And obviously, God is not pleased at all. When God made man, God made man in his image, after his likeness. In verse 20, it speaks of they made the golden calf and exchanged their glory, their, their importance, and gave it to this little ox and calls him God. We're then told in verse 21, uh, back in verse 20, that this is an ox. God made the ox whom eats grass. You are a human being. You eat your own food that God has provided. You have intelligence. But the image can't do anything. And the image of the animal is one who is inferior to the human. And yet the human is willing to prostrate themselves, bow down, which is this word here, to a little metal image. Now, if you think of it, like today, you know, if your children has these little die-cast uh, toys, and that that's what they are bowing down. They, they treat that little toy that they made as a god. This God, an L. And so they forgot God, their Savior. Now this idea of God, this word God, is L. This is also L. And so the word L is really the mighty one. And if they considered the golden calf L, well, they would have given the importance to that L, that little golden calf. They forgot that God was their Savior who rescued them out of Egypt, who has done great things in Egypt that they all can see. And that's why the Pharaoh of Egypt allowed them to go. So they forgot their El who rescued them. So now you can see in Hebrew, that's a word play. They forgot El. The El who took them out of Egypt. They are now calling this El. And this is the problem. In verse 22, they says, they forgot the wonders in the land of Ham. This would be Mitzraim, which is Egypt. So Ham, one of the sons of Noah, had actually occupied the land of what we call Africa today. And by and large, extended up into Canaan as well. And then it says, they forgot the awesome things done by the Yamsuf. So if you read this properly, the focus is they forgot. The idea of forget literally means to put something away and it becomes hidden. And so the meaning of this word is to, right here, misplace. It is to be oblivious, lose the memory. All of these are good words to explain what forget means. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt. So they also forgot the great things in Egypt. 
They forgot the wonders in Egypt and they forgot the parting of the Red Sea where they walked on dry land. So they thought that this little golden calf is now the one that rescued them from Egypt. And so they placed importance on the golden calf when they prostrated. That's what it means. Exchange their glory means to bow down to the golden calf. That they are now subservient to this L, which is the ox head L, the mighty one. They treat the calf as that L. Instead of Yehovah, the L who is their savior. These are things that David is saying, you must tell the good and the bad of the people. They have seen the greatness of God, and yet they have forgotten very quickly in Exodus chapter 32. How far away was that? They crossed the Red Sea in Exodus 14. They left in Exodus 13. And then they sang celebratory songs in Exodus 15. And so a little bit, 15 over chapters thereof after they arrived in Mount Sinai, the people completely forgot everything. Now, one of the things you see as a repetition in the Bible is that the Israelites have very short memory. And so the Jews call themselves people of short memory because of all these things that's written in the song that's based on the public events that they are to read over and over again to remind them the mighty hand of God can destroy you, can judge you, can rescue you and yet you could actually forget. And so now if you read verse 23 verse 23 says this Therefore he, God said that he, God, would destroy them. Now, this is important. The idea of destroy here is to cause them to be exterminated. This word here. Cause to be exterminated. If you like the word annihilated. God was so angry that he didn't want the Israelites anymore. How can they, after such a short period of time, forget about God? And that's all in Exodus chapter 32. So please remember when they read Psalms like this, they remember what actually happened. If Moses, his chosen one, had not stood in the gap before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Same word, to destroy, is to ruin them. To, well, I guess you can say, to ruin them. It's a slightly different word from the first word. So what did Moses do? Moses pleaded with God. Please don't exterminate them. They are your people. People will talk that you brought them out of Egypt only to kill them in the wilderness. God wanted to start his plan again with the descendants of Moses because Moses was the one that he called friend who would sit down and listen to what God says and do exactly what God says. And so had Moses not turned away the wrath. Now this word turn away is the same word as repent. God reversed his anger. So anger can be reversed. What does that mean? In the anger, God wanted to destroy the Israelites, completely remove all of them. At the same time, when Moses pleaded with God, that anger was turned away, and so God took a different direction. 
that he would not destroy them, but he would punish them anyways. Now, this is a just God. Just because these people angered God doesn't mean they can go away scot-free. That would not be fair. If they had made the golden calf and replaced God, and God did nothing, then what does it say about God? Is he forgiving? No. It would be, you know, when you put God in the eye or slap God in the face, and God says it's okay. It's not okay. And so when you go back and read Exodus chapter 32, you would find that uh, the story ends right at the end uh, that a plague came down. And when the plague came down, uh, Exodus 30, I guess you can say Exodus 32 was the, the, the major problem. The major problem uh, where they will be destroyed. And we are told in Exodus chapter 32, uh, they were asking, who is going to stand on Jehovah's side? And so the sons of Levi did that. And then the sons of Levi uh, went to kill the other group who actually did all these things. Now the sons of Levi includes Aaron. And so Aaron was rescued in that sense, that they stood on God's side and they chose the correct side. By that action, in Numbers chapters 3 and 4, we will eventually see that God rewarded the Levites, that they will become the ones to serve God. And all the firstborn that God said in Exodus chapter 13, God is going to give them back to be redeemed to their rightful families. And so this is what it means by turning away the anger of God. So God responds to the events. God responds to the pleading of Moses. But you will find that this happens only in very unique situations. It's not a, an everyday affair, if you want to call it that. Now, in verse 24 to 27, you find that this is another expression. In verse 24, they rejected the land or rejected the pleasant land and they did not believe in his word. And so we find here is that this is uh, an and then that's that's there. The idea of reject, this is and then, they refused. Uh, they refused, they cast away. And so this one you can read in Numbers. Chapters 13 and 14. And if you recall that episode, they sent 12 spies into the land when they are expected to go in. 10 came back with reports that, oh, you shouldn't go in because you'd be dead in there. The people look at us like we are grasshoppers. And then you get uh, Joshua and Caleb. They came back saying, this is exactly what God has said. So they did not believe in his word. Now this word believe uh, literally means be firm. They did not stand on God's word that this is a land flowing with milk and honey. Now the concept of faith in Hebrew terms is that after seeing you have experience. And then you have knowledge. And based on this knowledge, you stand firm on what you have seen and experienced. And so 
what God has is saying, I'm going to bring you into the land of Egypt. What God is saying that I'm going to bring you into the land flowing with milk and honey was based on what they have seen God do in Egypt. The ten miracles, crossing the Red Sea, and, and I guess after we read above, they forgot. They thought that the golden calf would be their God. And so when it came to the promised land, they forgot. And so they did not stand firm on God's word. So what did they do? They grumbled in their tents. They did not listen to the voice of God. And God tells them to go in and possess the land, but they refuse. Therefore, as a consequence, and you can see it's something about God. God is an interactive God. Based on what they are doing, God swore to them they would fall in the wilderness and that he would bring down their descendants among the nations and scatter them in their lands. This happened later. But what was immediate was this. God did not bring a plague to kill them. Notice, in their disobedience, they were refused entry into the promised land. The first generation. Generation number one would be the 20-year-old and above. These were the ones, them. Please bear that in mind. But we do find there were two other generations. This would be 20-year-old and below. And then we have the third generation that would be born in the wilderness. Why were they born in the wilderness? Because God said they will fall in the wilderness and this will be 40 years. Basically, another 38 years. And in that 38 years, another generation came. And so into the promised land, God gave it to these two generations. But this one here, God did not destroy them there and then. Even though they did not listen to the voice of God, God immediately prevented them from going in to the promised land. Why? Because they have seen the hand of God. They have seen the powers of God. They have seen the miracles of God. They have seen the incredible, awesome works of God, that which is being discussed, and, and they have to keep talking about it. And when they rejected all that and replaced God with a golden calf and they don't want to go in, God immediately judged them unworthy. Why didn't God give them another chance? Because they had seen the second and third generation are the younger ones. And God gave them a chance. And they went in voluntarily. And so what is essentially important is the first generation were the ones who had decided that they should go back to Egypt. And God swore. When God swears, you would find that this word here, it's very strict. It will happen. And in the justice of God, these died because they had seen and yet they did not hold on to what God said. The second and third generation were the ones who were much younger. In fact, number three didn't exist at the time of Mount Sinai. Number two were too young. But God says these younger ones they would hold on to the word of God as Moses gave them in the book of Deuteronomy and they would go in. And so herein lies the deeds of God, that God is an interactive God. God saw what they did and God would judge them on what they did, not what they think on what they did. Their positioning, their choices, because choices have consequences. God is the fair judge. God is a God of justice. And in so doing, 
He had to do the difficult things, but he was still fair. So while the plan of God to give them the promised land was stuck by the first generation here, the plan of God was delayed by another 38 years because God had to let all of these people die. Eventually, Aaron, Miriam, and last, Moses. And then thereafter, Joshua and Caleb brought the rest in, and they were the two spies who trusted God in his word that they have seen and they believe that they can overcome and conquer the land. Even though by sight, they saw that there were big people there, like the ten. But the big people they saw, they didn't believe God will be with them as had been with them in Egypt. Now, songs like these are recited, reviewed, repeated, sung to remind the people and the non-Jews of the greatness of God that even his people, he will deal fairly and justly by his very powers. He is a true and living God and a golden calf made of metal gold cannot replace the powers of a true and living God. And so with this, we come to the end of our session today.